The Sport of Fast Draw only shoots wax bolts and full powder blanks. No live lead ammo is ever used. All techniques are for descriptive purposes only. Find a club or gunfighter near you for help. Fast Draw has an excellent safety record and would like to keep it that way. The Final Shot Saloon and its guests and the associations referred to herein accept no responsibility for irresponsible gun handling. Be safe. Ready on one, ready on two. Shooters on the line. Shooter set. Hello everyone and welcome to Behind the Light Gunfighter Profiles. This is where I talk to modern day gunfighters from the sport of fast draw and other western shooting sports. I also pay homage to our historical western gunfighters. The beginning and a few other of these uh, questions are going to sound a little different just because for some reason it kind of goofed up throughout the interview. Um, bear with me. But I really wanted to do a, a decent introduction to our guest. He has been a 16 world record holder in the sport of fast draw. He's been seen on the History Channel, More Extreme Marksman, and on All Jacked Up on CMT. He is also the creator of FastDraw.org, Mr. Howard Darby. Thanks for coming on, Howard. Thanks, Quint. So how did you come about to get in the sport of fast draw? Well, probably like a lot of people are doing, I was into the Old West reading in the history and reading Louis L'Amour, Zane Gray, and that sort of stuff. And uh, when I was in college, I saw an article in the paper about the Thunderbird Fast Rock Club and Dennis Robinson and the group that were shooting in uh, at Langley. And I was living in North Vancouver at the time, which is part of the greater Vancouver area, or Langley is part of. And uh, I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, when I graduated college a few months later and had free time, I uh, went out one night to see, see what it was like and and it couldn't get rid of me after that. <laughs> he got me involved. I was shooting in a contest within a few weeks down in Washington, and and uh, it's just gone from there. I uh, transferred jobs a few times in cities and moved across Canada, but uh, I've managed to keep at it and formed a club here in Calgary where I'm at, so it's, uh, it's something I've been doing for about 32 years now. Oh, wow. Uh, what came first, the spinning or the fast draw? Actually, it was the spinning I, uh, when I was about 17. I couldn't buy a gun legally legally in Canada at that point. I had to be 19, but uh, so I bought a, uh, a replica handgun, a non-firing pop metal sort of type, uh, and a really cheap holster, and uh, got that for my birthday one year when I was turned 17, and uh, started spinning it because you couldn't do anything else with it, and uh, started doing tricks and flipping it over my shoulder, and that came in handy later on. It's a good way to keep your gun hand up and get familiar with the, uh, the gun and the action. When did you finally get into the spinning of a, of a real gun? Uh, after I bought my first fast draw gun, which I, I started shooting in 81, so just uh, I was 19, almost 20 years old. and uh, uh, So just a couple of years after I started spinning, I bought my first one and got into fast draw, and uh, that's when I started using that one. Um, and now that I had a second 
sort of two guns, the pop metal one and the, and the real gun, I, uh, I started doing two gun tricks and five, eventually a few years later bought a second fast draw gun. So I was doing gun spinning with my fast draw gun for at least the first, oh, 10 years. It wasn't until I'd been uh, gun spinning for, well, and I was 81 when I started fast draw, about in 79 when I started spinning. And uh, I didn't buy my first real or sort of non-fast draw gun until it was probably around 1990, 91. I bought a matching set of Ruger Vaqueros, the old style of Ruger Vaqueros. And uh, that's when I stopped beating up my faster guns by dropping them on the ground in concrete floors when I was doing demos somewhere in a parking lot. And um, I took it a little easier on my faster guns and, and let the uh, Ruger Vaqueros take the beating when I dropped them. <clears throat> now, do, how many, do you hold uh, like championship titles in spinning too? Yeah, I managed to win. I think it was six world titles in that. Um, it wasn't a. It wasn't a big sport. Uh, usually, uh, a lot of people at the faster contest. Although there were some Japanese that came over and competed, and Joey uh, Del, uh, yeah, Joey uh, showed up a few times at uh, the first few, and I managed to beat him the first few times. But he's he's probably the best fast uh, gun spinner there is out there, and he uh, he uh, eventually got so good he he was he was beating everybody that was coming out to, to compete in the fast or the gun spinning competitions. Oh really. No, he doesn't shoot any fast draw. He's just a, a spinner. Or... Yeah, that's right. But he's a good uh, all-around uh, sort of single-action guy. He's been on a few TV shows. I've talked to him a few times, and people contact me to do gun spinning stuff in the States. And it's hard for me to come down to the States to do a lot of stuff because um, of the border stuff. So uh, I'll often pass on my gun spinning stuff they ask me to do to, to him, and he takes he, he does a good job. Oh, okay. It's a, it's quite the community that the Western shooting sports or Western genre uh, sports has, because it seems like everybody seems to get along pretty well, in the in the most part. Yep, that's right. And uh, I managed to learn and, and a lot about it and, and get to know a lot of the people with my gunfighter zone when I had the forums. Ran that for about fifteen years, and uh, it, I got to know a lot of the people in the reenacting. Not so much the cowboy action, but uh, gun spinning and, and fast run. And, uh, it, it's a good community. A lot of uh, a lot of good people doing doing a lot of interesting stuff. Speaking of the gunfighter zone, before uh, that was even up, there was nothing on the internet about uh, gun spinning or fast run, was there? No, in fact, when I got when I started the gunfighter zone, and uh, it was '96, I got into the internet in '95. Decided I was going to create my own website in 90, early 96 and uh, registered gunfighter.com. And when I put the forums on there uh, within the first few months, there wasn't even any discussions on Cowboy Action, which was a huge, huge sport at the time. Um, mine was the first discussion forum for Cowboy Action, um, Fastra, Gun Spinning, um, reenacting so that's why i got got a lot of people coming over and starting to use it um we got a lot of traffic there in the first number of years uh, just after 15 years of doing it and a lot of the politics and things that were going on and spammers that were coming along it just got too much of a headache for me to stay, yeah. continue it and i just let uh, let things take their own path and it looks like fast facebook's now a good good way to manage a lot of that i'll see if it wasn't for fastrod.org or in the discussion board, I don't think we'd be here talking today. Yeah, and that's, I'm glad to hear that. That's, that's, I hear that from quite a few people, and that's, that's the reason I, I did it. It was, it. it was nice to talk to the people you know and see the shoots and stuff like that, but it was mainly to get the word out on the sport and yeah. uh, help it grow. So I'm glad, it, I'm glad it helped. Now, have you always been, in the past episodes of Behind the Light, I've talked about uh, fanning and thumbing and up fanning and and stuff like that have you always been an up fanner uh i the the, the club that i started with dennis robinson he, he tends to teach people uh poke fanning or ram fanning if you shorten it up a little bit um as the starting point as the basis for everything it's it's a good way to get started and and, and hit the target pretty consistently uh, soon after you get started so everything was built from there it was um shortening it up going to up fanning and then at the time it was the uh mid 80s i was uh, twist fanning went uh, i jumped into twist fanning after sort of getting good at bulk fanning ram fanning up fanning 
uh, just shortening it up more and more until I, you know, you're, you're firing just as the tip of the barrel's coming out of the holster there. But, uh, you know, it's whatever, whatever, after that, it was pretty much whatever the fastest style was. Um, sometimes you need to do thumbing because it's a thumbing contest. But uh, other than that, it was pretty much doing whatever I could do within the elite rules of the sport to make it the fastest I yeah. could do. It Was there one thing about the sport when you first were getting into it that really just hooked you? For me, it was blanks. Well, it was It was blanks and eight foot. <laughs> and I, that was the start for me. Uh, yeah, that was well. That's what I started with because the T birds at the time they were almost they they had their practice nights was Friday nights and there was usually anywhere from ten to twenty people out and they would set up four balloon targets and two wax targets and the lineups for the wax balloon targets were there was like people lined up waiting to use the long balloon targets and so it was uh, that was the big thing. Everybody most almost everybody shot. The balloons, and then when you couldn't get on the balloons, you went and shot in the wax. <laughs> so yeah, balloons were always the, the popular one. But a lot of clubs now, any club, my club now, well, we hardly ever do balloons because it's just it's a lot easier to do the wax. And I'm sure a lot of people do that because of the, um, uh, the shooting their basement or whatever. But um, whatever it was that uh, well, the, for the speed, that's that's where I <laughs> sort of went to. And the other thing about the sport for me was. I liked the individual nature. I'm not a. I play team sports, and I, and I like that. But my main sports I do are all sort of individual. I like and, and the instant feedback the faster. Like, you know, you try something and bang, you can see it was a 25-7 in the last shot. It was a 26, so maybe it's a little better. Whatever you just did that last shot, so you can keep tweaking it and, and get instant feedback. Yeah. And being a very analytic and computer sort of guy, I like that <laughs> instant technical feedback on what I'm doing. <laughs> A lot of people believe our sport is very expensive. What's your what is your take on on how expensive our sport is? My my brother does golf. He's a he's a golfer, so he spent a lot of money buying his clubs. I spent a lot of money buying my guns and getting them tuned up and the targets. But I, it's probably a wash by the time he's bought all his clubs and uh, and I bought all my guns and stuff. And then he's got uh, to pay every time he goes plays golf. He's got a got to play memberships and all that so yeah i think i'm i'm coming out ahead on this point <laughs> yeah with doing golf uh you know you've probably traveled a good distance around the united states and even canada what do you have a favorite location you've ever shot uh i think the my favorite location is the next contest i'm i'm going to i just shot in red river for the first time uh, about a month ago, and uh, that's a really nice location. There's a ton of... I, I, I like going to new locations. If a contest has been at the same place for a number of years, it sort of gets a little boring, and, it, and it's uh, that's, you, you see that from you know, the, the uh, entrances always drops after the first few years. But uh, I like interesting locations. Uh, there was one at um, Colorado last year at a, at, a, at a fair. Those ones are always nice when you get a lot of audience participation or, or sorry, watching... Um, anything that's interesting is uh, Pismo Beach was one that I always remember. It was out right on the, on the boardwalk or on the pier parking lot in front of the ocean uh, back in 85, 86. Uh, uh, Sam's Town in Vegas was an interesting one. Oh, wow. um, the ones at Deadwood was always a good one. Uh, I've been there a lot of times, but that's one of the ones, a few, few ones that doesn't get too tiring after a lot of years because there's always neat stuff to do there. Yeah. Now you have two sons that shoot, and your wife also is shooting. That's right. Yeah, and Whitney shot before we had kids, and then sort of gave it up while, while she was raising them, and just harder to get to the gun range here in Canada. We can't shoot her in our garage or in a basement like a lot of Americans can. So uh, I have to go to a gun range. We do that every Monday night. It's hard for her to get a babysitter and all that. So she gave it up um, until the kids became old enough that. Um, they wanted to get involved too, and then so we decided to do it all as a family, and uh, had some had some good times in Durango last year and the year before. I mean, as a dad, it's got to be pretty cool to see your sons up there shooting a sport that you that you love. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was one of the highlights. I was a lot more nervous for my sons in the last two contests they were out with me uh, than I was for myself, uh, especially when Connor ended up winning his division at the world title uh, championships last year that was one of the proudest moments for me in the sport and and, and i've been doing it 31 years so yeah. that was a great weekend because he was he was really doing well i i got to 
Well, I, I edited the the video for uh, for the it, for the Final Shot Saloon channel, but I got to see the whole contest from uh, Nick the Quick's video, you know, and he he just lets it, his camera run, so it was pretty cool to watch. <coughs> Excuse me, the people, and especially like Connor doing, uh, just keep shooting well throughout the whole contest and finally winning at the end. It was it was pretty cool. And that's the weird thing about that, and I think for new shooters and, and anybody to think about, he had only been shooting for really a few months before that, and it was all laser practice in our basement. Um, we have a laser that goes in the barrel, and uh, you can just put a target on the wall, and the timer I have can pick up, pick up the sound of the hammer falling. Um, so we get it some of the times. It doesn't work all the time, but it, it works enough time. You can see generally what time you're shooting. And he was doing terribly. Um, he, In fact, he didn't want to even shoot in the contest. And we said, hey, look, we'll just pay the money, and if you lose three rounds in a row, don't worry about it. And he couldn't. He, he was hitting maybe, making the gun go bang, maybe a, a third of the time when he were practicing at home. And somehow he got on the line and he learned it. He learned how to do it online. Now, that's not what I'm going to recommend for everybody, but <laughs> it's don't worry about what you do in practice. Go to a contest to get the experience, and you might surprise yourself and sort of learn how to do it. You might be one that works under pressure really well. <laughs> um, but don't uh, the, go to a contest, start shooting. Um, even if you don't do well, you learn a ton of stuff at the contest. Like Nick always says to new shooters, he's helped a, a lot of some new people get involved. Going to the contest is like going to 100 rounds of practice. Uh, you, you'll learn so much in a contest that, that you'll never learn just by shooting by yourself in your garage. Yep, and I, I totally agree with that. I uh, One thing that I try to always tell people, because I've, you know, you always hear from people who really don't know the sport. I'm going to shoot myself in the foot. I'm not going to be that fast. Um, you know, I've even heard it's a young man's game. And if you really look at the, the shooters, they're usually 35 and up. I mean, kind of my 35. Guess, you know, 35. Kind of, yeah, kind they're of very my, young. Kind of my guesstimate, you know. And uh, the one thing that I tr I try to tell people also is you. The one thing you want to practice at home is really the safety part of it. You want to, I mean, you should always practice that, but you want to practice the the down, the commands, if you at least have a shooting partner. Um, when Vern and I would shoot together, it was always, all right, shoot her down, you know, uh, excuse me, <laughs> down range. We always practice the command, so... We, when we went to a contest, it, we didn't have to really, that was already second nature. And then we, the shooting came next. Because when you go to a contest, you're always going to be super nervous at your first contest, I, in my opinion. And so if you, yep. if you work on that safety part, at least you won't get disqualified for something silly that you could have probably practiced, you know, a while back. And as a new shooter, it, it, that's one of the main main things I think is the safety part of it that's, that's right and and if people don't know what what the safety part of it is they don't uh, they don't have somebody to practice with and somebody who knows what's going on at a contest make sure you tell somebody at the contest hey look this is my first time can you walk me through and and people are more than happy to do that uh, uh, people should be aware of that that uh, don't think you can't get in the sport because you don't know anybody who knows that what's going on. Just make sure you let, tell people the contest, and they'll be they'll, they'll let you know. So, what kind of advice would you give a brand new shooter uh, as far as like getting started and practicing or or whatnot? Well, one of the things I always try and teach people is uh, shoot naturally. A lot of people will try and um, line them, well, make sure they shoot uh, straight on. If they find their shoot slightly to the left, make, uh, adjust your body so that you either stand to the right or turn your body to the left. Don't don't try it because somebody tells you, well, you need to stand here, you need to do this, and then you'll hit the target and you find you don't. Don't force it. Find out where you shoot when you do your natural draw and uh, 
and and move into that position or twist your or, or turn yourself so that you'll your natural draw will hit at that at the, at where you shoot. You know what I mean? Yep. <clears throat> you don't want to force it too much because that's going to slow everything down. Um, if you're if you're tw- tw- turning things around or or adjusting to to hit a certain place, because isn't it like uh, I've always heard that smooth is fast. So you you don't always want to have like a jerky draw or you know kind of an awkward, like you said you you want it natural so that when you're pulling the gun it's you're not tensed up in any spot. Or I don't know if I'm using the right terminology, but um, I guess I, I, that's all I could think of. No, no, I know what you mean. Yeah, uh, it's kind of tough to convey it to to some listeners because it's it, you kind of got to show somebody sometimes. But um, sometimes people get into weird, weird stances, and they're wondering why they're shooting the way they are. And uh, I think the most part is they're. For me, I, I know when I get tense, I seem to shoot slower. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, and if you, it, it's it's shooting naturally, and like you said, minimalist. Um, if you can draw, break it down, and take out any unneeded motion, an unneeded way of weird way of putting your hand around your elbow out or something, make it so that you're 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 moving as least amount of your body when you draw that you need to. Anything that's moving, like if you stick out your elbow, and a lot of people do that, and then they snap it in. Um, some people, maybe help some people get, get the gun up. For me, I always figured if if I need, if I end up with my elbow against my body, not not out, well, that's where I should have it to start with, because I'm, I shouldn't be moving that. If I, if I turn my hand a certain way and it comes out and it ends up in a different position I should start in that position I don't want to I don't want to be moving anything more than I need to minimize minimize the draw as much as possible because I've actually tried that elbow out thing and to be honest that's uncomfortable <laughs> yeah it's it, it I don't know it, I almost feel like I'm ready to take off for flight or something i just i never cared for it. every once in a while i feel it creep out but it's you know i don't know i, I never cared the only, for it. and the only way i would suggest doing that is, is some people find it helps them get up and out of the holster um but if you can do it without it it's you're just minimizing what you need to move to, while you're drawing and the least you can move the faster you're going to be and you touched on another point you touched on um thinking about it uh, the well, the one thing that helped me—I was always shot myself and not shot myself. I shouldn't say literally <laughs> shot myself in the foot, but I—I I, I was always screwing myself up in the last few rounds of a contest. I would do be fast, one of the fastest in the contest, until it came down to the last three or four people, and then I x out really fast. And it was all mind games. It was my if if you there's a book called The Inner Game of Tennis that a lot of people read in this sport. If you read that book, what it teaches you is how to keep the part of your mind that thinks out of the equation of doing your draw or doing whatever you're going to do. And that's not when it's about tennis, but it, it, it relates to any sport. Um, you have two parts of your mind, the, the part that thinks about what it's doing and the part that knows what it's going to do. And that's often called muscle memory or whatever you want to call it. It's this thing that's practiced and practiced and practiced and knows how to do what you're going to do. And when you're not thinking about it, it just does it. And that's when you do your good stuff. When the other part of the mind comes along and says, oh, crap, it's coming down to the last few rounds and i got to do really well. I better not miss this shot. When you're waiting for the light, it's it's trying to override the other part of the mind that knows what it's doing, and it gets in the way, and it screws that up. And that's what was happening to me And uh, until I read the book and learned a few techniques about how to stop that part of the mind interfering the part of the mind that knows what it's doing. And also, when you said you don't think about it, if you're not thinking too much about it, if you just go sort of perfectly blank, you're in the ideal condition, and it's hard to get to, but you're in the ideal condition where you're letting that part of your mind, the muscle memory, that part of your body, know or let it do exactly what it knows how to do at the optimal peak of performance. The I think you and I actually talked about it 
uh, either at a contest or on Facebook or something. Uh, the book that I read was called Practical Shooting, and that yeah, that was... it had the same the same um, talk about the the mental game of the of shooting. That's right. I've heard of that book, and I, I it's, it's I think it's a, a follow up on that one uh, based on the shooting sports. So uh, very similar things. Yeah. It, and when you're a lot of people, they see the only the physical part. Uh, it really is a lot of mental. I mean, you can really oh, yeah. you can really hurt your like you were just saying. You can really if you're having a bad day, and you start really thinking about it, your bad day just got worse. <laughs> In my opinion, yep. Yep. Um, you see a lot of good shooters uh, get really upset up there on the line, and that's pretty much it. I mean, they're pretty much spent for the day. Yep, yep, seen it over and over. Uh, if you can get that mental side of it out and keep an even, even keel, uh, don't let anything bother you. Don't let that last round bother you. It's hard to do, but if you can get that out of your mind, it can help you a lot better. Because just for the listeners to know, I this is just my opinion, but Howard is one of the most calm people I've ever seen up on the line. <laughs> I I've never I've I think I've seen you. Uh, you know, if we're talking X's, I think I've seen you get two X's put on you and stay as calm as can be, and still win the mat, still win the round. So, if you want to learn from someone. Just watch Howard and how calm that guy or Howard is, and you'll uh, you'll be surprised because he's got it. Uh, and, go ahead. And those books, they, that's what helps. That's what helps because I, that's what you get the pressure on you. And if you don't know how to handle that, and I didn't for the first twenty years, I did this work. Um, that's what will get you. So yeah, either either hopefully you've got that by yourself. If not, read the Inner Game of Tennis or that one you mentioned. What's that one, Quint? Uh, uh, practical shooting. Practical shooting; those two books they help. It will help you um, if you if you can't get to that state all by yourself. Yeah. As far as guns and holsters, do you have like one uh, holster maker that you use, or a gun uh, gunsmith that you use? Uh, well, all my holsters uh, are Mernicle holsters, um, FD7, the main one I'm using. Uh, the thumbing one I'm using. Also, one he made me years ago. Um, uh, the guns, all uh, mine were all made by uh, Greg Danielson. Actually, uh, he's he does a good job. And I think some of the earlier ones, the uh, the first one I got from him, the first couple of years, uh, John Phillips who also did part of the work on it. Uh, so they're they're good guns. In fact, I bought I bought two guns off of him back 15 years ago. One gun I bought, and then it was so good I thought, oh, I'll get a second one, and. Uh, I really have not touched that second one, other than Connor used it uh, at the, one of the contests, I think, and uh, for a few people in the family. But other than that, uh, that's my backup gun that I don't know if I'll ever need to back up to use it. And that was from uh, John first one, so, uh, both, both of them are Greg Danielson, with a little okay. help from John Phillips. I think he does, he, some of the parts are his, and he might do some of the minor work on it. But, um, of course, he's, he passed away a few years ago, but so I think uh, Greg does them all now himself. Oh wow, what do you uh, what do you think about the Hollywood fast draw coming in? I think it's a good uh, a, a good uh, entry point for new people, uh, people who want to just do the um, uh, more traditional style of fast draw. Uh, it's it's becoming very competitive in, in Dura uh, Red River and Durango this year. There was as many or more people in that than there were in Double A, and uh, it was a tough division. Um, there was a lot of a lot of people shooting in the mid threes, and uh, but I mean there was a lot of people shooting uh, slower, and, and they were having a good time too. So it's a good place to start. Yeah, I think it really. Or, or not even not just start, but it's a good place to to be shooting because it's it's a very competitive division now. I think with the the uh, when when I first got into it, uh, Cowboy Fast Row was just starting, and I think it really helped uh, a bring. A little more, I don't want to say life to the sport, but it really got other associations to think about an entry level uh, for, like you said, for uh, for beginners. 
and it really i i we practiced it up here for quite a while and we had a good time we only shot on silhouette targets but uh it's really a fun fun deal yeah and uh because most cowboy action shooters or anybody who's into the old west style of shooting has has the gun and holsters they can use in that division it's people don't have to go out and buy new stuff to to think they can be competitive as long as they and they practice a little bit, and they can they come out and, and shoot with everybody else. So I do have to ask you, how did you get on more extreme marksmen? How did that come about? Well, we'll go back uh, a few a few years back to uh, when I was asked to help with um, the Book of Cool, which was a U.S. or U.K. company putting together about 30 or 35 of the world championships and champions in different sports that would teach people like a five or ten or a dozen of their uh, main tricks and they had the best pool pool player in the world and the best card shark guy and the best um, frisbee guy and a, a bunch of the, sort of the best people in the world and for some reason they wanted to include gun spinning they didn't want to do fast draw because it was from the uk and they can't really shoot um uh, fast draw that easily over there but they said well a lot of people probably have fake guns or the pop metal guns and they, and they can learn to gun spin it and they liked it so they figured a lot of other UK people might so they included that in the in the in the video and uh, I went down to Vegas and filmed with them and uh, it, it's it, it's uh, they, the, the fast draw part of that they asked me to do a couple small fast draw things but it was there's was mainly about gun spinning and uh, so they asked me to do a little PR on that so I, I put up I, since I do websites I put up a website with with some information on me and and the, and the video, and uh, that was on the internet. And then I got a lot of a lot of um, contact from different TV shows asking me, "Well, you're the fast draw guy. Can you come down and, and do the fast draw?" So they were them, and uh, I got a lot of contact from well, lots of different com uh, TV companies. It's sort of funny. The bigger the TV show, the the least they want to spend. Like I got contacted by uh, um, MythBusters. You know they did a TV show about about gunfighter stuff. Yep, I saw. And they that. were going to fly me down there, and they they wanted me to pay to fly myself down and pay my all my expenses down there. They had no money to pay me anything. Um, and I said, well, no, as long as you can pay me to come down, I'll do it for free. I like MythBusters; it'd be cool to be on there. So and still, they didn't. They ended up at the last moment canceling me and saying, oh, we found a guy who who has a gun and says he knows how to fat too fast on, he'll do it. And nobody would anybody have ever heard, but they no. were so cheap. They didn't want to pay for anybody who knew anything <laughs> about fast <laughs> And And so I, I got that, and I got a number of other TV shows, uh, the Extreme Marksman, that was a cool one. They they found me from that and uh, contacted me and, and brought me down to L.A. to shoot that. Um, and a few others like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's been interesting working with some of these uh, companies the bigger they are, the cheaper they are. <laughs> the small companies, they, all, they always have the money to pay, come bring you down and pay you some expense money and that stuff like that. But uh, the big companies, they're, they're real cheap skates. Now, you actually got to be on, uh, I don't know if it's even still on, but jacked up with, uh, was it C. Thomas Howell? Yeah, yeah. He was. I was teaching him how to be a gunfighter. Okay. I taught, taught him a little bit about fast draw and uh, some gun spinning, and uh, that was a bit of a mismatch because I flew down to L.A. Friday night. They were going to have a, they rented an old west town up in the hills um, and had a film crew of 30 people and C. Thomas Howell, and uh, I was I was providing all the guns and arrows and holsters and everything, and uh, I got there at 9 a.m., 9 p.m. on Friday night at LAX, and they lost my bags. I had no ammo, no guns, no holsters, no clothing, no nothing. Luckily, I had uh, friends like Bob Bussinger and John Wilson in L.A. who I ran around all all evening with a guy from the production company and, and driving me all over L.A. We managed to pick up guns and holsters and clothes and stuff and, and managed to film the show. But that was a you know, became, almost almost was a real embarrassment. And, uh, and, but it worked out. And it all had to do with the airport. Yeah, they lost my bags. It went to, <laughs> turns out they went to Arizona. I got them back Sunday night. Um, just as I was leaving, um, but uh, I didn't lose anything. But uh, I didn't have my own stuff when I was shooting that, so I, but it worked out okay. And then you had uh, the the Fox Sports Channel on Sports Science. Now that's where the guy threw the football, right? 
Yeah, that was a weird one too because they they had me down there and they had uh, what was his name um, Trent Edwards. Trent Edwards, yeah, he was the quarterback for the Buffalo Bills at the time, or, or backup quarterback or something. And uh, they wanted to, they they compare things. They like to compare things scientifically. So the quarterbacks are called gunslingers. That's the nickname for them. So they said, well, we want to compare a quarterback against a real gunslinger. So they had me, and I was doing it. But the whole time we were there. They filmed us doing me doing the draw and Trent Edwards shoot, throwing the football at targets and things like that. But they had no idea how they were going to compare us. They they said, "Well, we'll figure that out later." And so they filmed us doing all sorts of stuff. And the, <laughs> I loved it because at the, the very end, they, the the comparison was hand speed. Hand speed when 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 we do whatever we do. He was throwing the ball. I was drawing the gun. Well, of course, I moved my hand one foot. And I lock in, so I'm not moving very far, and I'm stopping almost as soon as I start. He's doing a full a follow through and everything, and moving his hand like five or six feet to an arc. And he had the fastest hand speed, so he was better than yeah, he's a better gunfighter. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, there was sort of one of those cheap things they needed to make the uh, the big quarterback uh, be the winner. <laughs> yeah, because I, I watched that one and I looked at Jennifer and I went, "Are you serious?" Yeah. She even was like, "Yeah, that doesn't seem like it's right." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, well, it's it's PR. It's uh, it got the word on faster a little bit on the sports, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it, as long as the sports out there, I guess. Uh, is, do you have anything else coming up, like uh, shows or contests or anything that you'd be going to, or is this is the sport? It's usually uh, this is kind of the end time, isn't it? Yeah, I was at the last contest in New Mexico about a month ago, and uh, that's the end for the year. The only one on the schedule right now for next year is the Canadian Championships, but that's not unusual that most of the contests will show up at the beginning of the year, so we'll see where that goes. Uh, nothing else going on right now, but uh, we'll see what uh, what comes out for next year. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on, Howard. It's uh, always fun talking to you because we talk at the contest all the time, and you're a really great well, thanks, guy. Billy. Huh? And I appreciate your uh, efforts you're doing to get the word out too oh i appreciate it and uh i hopefully i will see you next year and i hope you will come back on the show um when i call you thanks <laughs> <laughs> thanks thanks much howard that was mr howard darby i hope you enjoyed the interview remember to go visit fastrod.org or gunfighterzone.com thanks again guys <laughs>